Welcome. My name is Peter Johnston, and I am a counselor on the Muskoka District Council. I am also on the Town of Gravenhurst Council. Before we get started, I want to spend a few minutes giving you an overview of what's going to take place during this presentation and a following lecture, which will be scheduled sometime in the next few weeks. The purpose of my talk is not to prove to you that climate change is real or to get you to sign some sort of pledge to do whatever you can to help our environment. I simply want to provide you with the facts as we know them. First and foremost, I want to raise your level of awareness about what climate change is, and I'm going to do it in such a way that will give you hope. You then can decide for yourself what to believe and what you think you can do about this problem. For this current lecture, I will talk about some of the very dire things happening right now with the environment on this planet because of climate change. In lecture number two, I'm going to tell you and show you why I'm very optimistic about the possible positive outcomes that are still attainable. People often ask me what we can do to stop climate change. My answer always must be we can't stop climate change. It's too late for that. We needed to do certain things 20 years ago, which we did not do. What we can do is slow down climate change and adapt our environment and our lives to the inevitable changes that are already underway. That is worth doing. More on that in the second lecture in this series. It seems like such a big problem, but every single individual doing their part collectively can make significant changes and benefits to their own lives and those lives of members of our society. One of Canada's most distinguished climate scientist is Catherine Hayhoe. She has appeared on many episodes of TED Talk, and often her presentations are about climate and the environment. She has two quotes which I want to share with you, which are at the core of my two library lectures in this series. First quote is, the best weapon we have against climate change is hope. Hope begins when you are standing in the dark and looking out into the light. The second quote is, the most important thing you can do to fight climate change is to talk about it. In my upcoming second lecture, I will give you many examples of serious environmental problems we encountered in the past. And collectively, we succeeded in doing what needed to be done. We can do it again. We must do it again. The second lecture in this series is to give you hope and to encourage you to talk about climate change often and regularly in your day-to-day -day life with your family and friends, your colleagues at work, your church congregations, or in your service club. My background includes over 35 years in local government management at both the municipal and provincial levels. That career began in Gravenhurst many years ago. When I decided in 2022 to run for elected office, my priorities were the environment and climate. I have two granddaughters, 17 and 18 years old, who live in Budapest, Hungary. They have lived all of their lives overseas, except for five or six weeks in Muskoka in July and August, where they stay at their parents' waterfront home on a lake near Bala in Muskoka. Both of my granddaughters are involved in track and field at their local high schools and often travel to other parts of Europe for competition activities. Often they look for an opportunity before or after the meet to get together with individuals or groups to talk about climate change and encourage them to get involved. Three or four years ago, my granddaughters helped to organize and attended peaceful demonstrations in front of the Hungarian parliament every Friday afternoon once a month. The peaceful protests, the signs and posters, were to encourage the government of Hungary and governments around the world to be more positive and proactive in trying to mitigate the effects of climate change. They did that so that they could have a meaningful life. 
and their children and future generations would also have meaningful lives. When my granddaughters learned that I was going to run for elected office, they asked me to make a promise to them. They asked me to do everything I could within my power during my four years in office to make sure that when they eventually returned to Canada permanently to live, that the Muskoka they love, that Muskoka will still be here. I'm so proud of my two granddaughters. They inspire me. Everything I will do in the next four years is grounded in my two granddaughters and my two grandsons who live in Hamilton. I want to tell you a short story. It's called Just 14 Wolves. And it's an example of how all the environment is intricately linked together. Isaac Newton once said that for every action, there is an opposite reaction. One small action can have profound effects. You have heard the analogy of how a butterfly flapping its wings in Japan might cause rain on the eastern seaboard of the United States. It's called the butterfly effect. This 14 wolf story demonstrates how just a few participants helping each other can create monumental change. So here's the story, just 14 wolves. In 1995, 14 wolves were released into Yellowstone National Park. No one expected the miracle that the wolves would bring. It started with the wolves hunting deer. This led to a rapidly decreasing deer population. Thanks to the deer's absence, those parts of the park started to regenerate. Forests of aspen and willow started to flourish. That's when things really started to happen. With the trees and bushes came more berries and bugs. Then various bird species started to move in. With the increasing tree population, the beaver returned. And the dams they built provided habitats for otters, muskrats, and reptiles. The wolves also killed coyotes. As a result, the number of rabbits and mice grew, which meant more hawks and eagles, red foxes, badgers, and weasels in the park. Even the number of bald eagles and ravens rose. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. With more balance between predator and prey came the possibility for other species to thrive. There was less erosion because of increased vegetation, and the riverbanks were stabilized. The channels narrowed. More pools formed, and the rivers stayed more fixed in their course. So the wolves not only transformed the great ecosystem of Yellowstone Park, they also changed the park's physical geography. Just 14 wolves. We have seen that outcomes of global warming impact different areas of the earth differently. Despite this divergence in the outcomes, yet it is called global warming. Why is that? How are the outcomes globally interconnected? Recently, Harvard researchers found that even global sea level rise could be sensed differently around the earth. This can be explained simply by the gravitational law of Newton. According to this law, objects attract each other. Once an ice sheet melts, the attraction between this object and the surrounding water dissipates. Therefore, the sea level in the very same place that the ice sheet used to stay goes down temporarily. At the same time, the sea level rises far from the ice sheet because more water has been added to the ocean. For this reason, if Greenland melts down, Newfoundland and Labrador may be flooded, while the sea level in Greenland reduces. That is how global warming causes a domino of interconnected problems that are being unfolded every day. While one coastline sea level rises, in another coastline it might decrease. Consequently, the climate of Greenland matters to Canadians. Another example is the recent behavior of Arctic watersheds. Forest fires are observed every year in the Arctic. Once a forest fire occurs in the Arctic, the chemistry of streams in the area changes. The concentration of carbon and nitrogen depends on the dissolved particles in the stream, 
which can dramatically change when trees are burnt. This effect can remain in the area for several decades, and it impacts not only the residents of the Arctic, but the residents that live far from the Arctic. The streams starting in the Arctic finally drain the water bodies that are the main source of drinking water for many people. Therefore, a forest fire hundreds or thousands of kilometers away can alter water qualities in another part of the country. As you can see, global warming is really a global problem. And a global problem can only be solved by global cooperation between nations, governments, and organizations that are active in the fight against the climate crisis. The Rio Negro is one of the main tributaries of the Amazon River, and it has reached its lowest level in 120 years. It is creating a punishing predicament in the daily lives of people living along its banks. Some areas in the Amazon River's watershed have received less rain between July and September of last year than any year since 1980. The drought has been particularly severe in the Rio Negro watershed in northern Amazonas. According to news outlets, the low river water levels on the Rio Negro and other nearby rivers have disrupted drinking water supplies in hundreds of communities, slowed commercial navigation down and led to fish and other marine animal die-offs. Bill Gates says that Fighting against climate change has multiple aspects and demands global cooperation. Politicians may have differences about the solutions, but the goal, the fight against climate change toward net zero in 2050, must be agreed upon. People are not powerless. They have their responsibilities and must act. Scientists also have key roles. Gates believes that advances in innovation and technology are also required to decline harmful emissions. One of the key areas that needs immediate advance is battery technology. Without powerful batteries that can store a great deal of energy for long times, it is difficult to count on reliable new energies as a standalone power source. Fossil fuel power plants should be replaced by nuclear ones to avoid introducing more greenhouse gas emissions from power generation. Gates believes that new generations of Nuclear plants are less prone to catastrophic accidents. There must be a commitment from the public to ensure that harmful emissions are declining as much as possible. This will happen only when green premium becomes affordable. Climate prime is the extra cost of goods that are produced with minimal damage to the environment. For example, local products and goods produced by green companies. As an example, Gates explains how cement production needs this evolution. Current cement production consumes lots of energy and the process emits carbon dioxide. Therefore, the production introduces harmful emissions to the atmosphere through two sources. There are green types of cement, however, they cost nearly double. Development can't be stopped as the population grows and the economy depends on development. Therefore, the only solution is to make green types of cement and other goods affordable so that traditional ones can be replaced by more sustainable products. Bill Gates is optimistic that climate crisis can be managed and this will be the greatest achievement of human history. The Arctic is experiencing hot days. The extent and frequency of these hot days sets a new record each year since 2016, with 2023 expected to follow the same trend. A few weeks ago, a small Siberian town set a new record of 38 degrees centigrade during the day. The frequency and extent of wildland fire has increased in Siberia. This time last year was 10 times larger than the same time the year before. Starting one month earlier this year, more than 1 million hectares of Siberian forests have burned since June, and it releases as much carbon dioxide than an industrialized country like Switzerland does in a full year. This in turn causes permafrost thaw. 
Permafrost, which is frozen soil in the Arctic, holds carbon and methane. When the thaw occurs, the trapped greenhouse gases are sent back into the atmosphere. The warming trend in the Arctic also accelerates melting snow cover. Therefore, the capacity of the Earth to reflect the heat reduces as soil is dark compared to the white snow. Recent research says that the sequential record-breaking hot days in Siberia is caused by man-made climate change. We are experiencing events that almost had no chance of occurrence without our impact on the global climate. The only thing that can be done and should be done and must be done is to commit to the Paris Agreement and aim at even larger goals to reduce the carbon dioxide by half by 2030. Permafrost is a land including soil and rock which does not go above freezing temperature for at least two years. As the global temperature rises, permafrost starts to, thaw, to thaw. This unveils plants and animals that throws before being decomposed. This has several negative consequences. The first one would be an increase in global sea level. Canada is blessed with abundant water resources and it's surrounded by oceans. So this is a particular risk for Canada. Frequent flooding events that are increasing from year to year can be partially attributed to this fact. Another consequence of permafrost thaw is the disturbance of the ecosystem of the area, which is home to many precious species, such as the polar bear. This phenomenon can also be expanded to other animals as well. Other consequences include land erosion, already being observed in Manitoba, Alaska, and Siberia. Ancient pathogens that escape from melting permafrost have real potential to damage microbial communities and might potentially threaten human health. The risks posed by this 1% of released, released pathogens may seem small, but given the sheer number of ancient microbes regularly released in the modern communities, this still represents a substantial hazard. The new findings suggest that the risk posed by time-traveling pathogens could be powerful drivers of ecological change and threats to human health. Another recently found undesirable outcome of permafrost thaw is releasing methane to the atmosphere. Methane is 100 times more powerful in rising global temperature than carbon dioxide. Just a quick note to uh, indicate some reason as to why we are what we are, where we are. This past June or July, G20 environmental ministers met in order to provide recommendations and updated information to the climate summit, which is happening in, in, in Dubai right now. At the end of that one week meeting in July of this year, the G20 environmental ministers were unable to come to agreement on anything. No consensus reached on key points, including curbing emissions and scaling up renewable energy, despite record temperatures and wildfires across the globe. Canada's 2023 wildfire season is the most destructive ever recorded. And it's not over yet. By September of this year, more than 6,132 fires had torched a staggering 16.5 million hectares of land. To put that in perspective, that's an area larger than the country of Greece and more than double the 1989 record. Teams of scientists and Canadian Forest Service technicians found that climate change has more than doubled the likelihood of extreme fire weather conditions in the province of Quebec. There's no question that extreme weather record high temperatures and dry conditions caused by climate change has intensified this year's wildfire crisis. Canada has experienced its warmest May through July period in over 80 years. A study found that climate change made the extreme intensity of this fire season at least, at least two times more likely than pre-industrial climate. 
Climate change is greatly increasing the flammability of the fuel available for wildfires because the trees, fallen trees, and underbrush are also dry. This means that a single spark, regardless of its source, can rapidly turn into a blazing inferno. From June 1st to the 25th of June this year, more land burned in southern Quebec than in the previous 20 years combined. A staggering 460,000 hectares were burnt. This year's fire activity could also impact forest carbon balance, biodiversity, and disrupt local businesses, forest sector economies, and indigenous communities. As wildfire risks will continue to intensify as the climate warms, Canada needs to reduce fossil fuel consumption and adapt fire management and mitigation strategies. There are different ways to manage wildfire risk, including controlled burns, revised forestry guidelines, and procedures to manage fuel around communities and infrastructure. It's a balance of these techniques that will help deal with future challenges. A changing climate means a proactive approach must be taken. Recent events can offer important lessons to be better prepared for the next time a devastating event like this occurs. Wetlands are among the major players in the carbon cycle. Wetland vegetation cover inhales carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Let me repeat that. Wetland vegetation cover inhales carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Along with water and sunlight, plants make their food out of these three. That is called photosynthesis. The wetland ecosystem has a large capacity to store carbon that is 700 kilograms per hectare per year. Wet plant, wetland plants have long roots and even can incorporate carbon into their leaves. Northern wetlands are of special interest not only because Canada has lots of them, but because freezing cycles decrease the decomposition rate of wetland. This means that boreal wetlands can live for centuries and serve as natural weather purifiers. That is why more than 450 billion tons of carbon are stored in North American natural weather purifiers. But what happens when a wetland is disturbed or dried, either for a nice cottage or as a result of a natural wildfire? Not only the wetland is not there to act as a carbon sink, but the stored carbon will also be released back into the atmosphere. So a powerful yet simple solution to regulate the climate is to just let the wetlands be. Just let the wetlands be. Wetlands are lands which are either covered by shallow water or have a water table close to the ground. Wetland has a vegetation cover that is water loving or tolerates water. Wetlands can be permanent or seasonal. These water-soaked areas are usually connected to a water body, such as a river or lake. Wetlands are of special importance because they can reduce the damage caused by floods. They can be used for recreational activities. They can be used for timber collection. They play a key role in local ecosystems, and they can inhale carbon dioxide in the air. In Ontario, there are more than 35 million hectares of wetlands. Toronto, however, has lost 85% of, it, of its wetlands. The government of Ontario offered grants and incentives to encourage residents to preserve wetlands because they are such a vital part of our efforts to slow down climate change. Climate change has been a public concern for years, maybe more than a decade. It gradually became a serious stressor and led to the Paris Agreement signed in 2016. Some countries did not sign the agreement or some countries that did are not following their commitments. The agreement set the goal to limit the average global temperature rise to two degrees centigrade above the average global temperature of the pre-industrial era, but try to keep it at 1.5 degrees centigrade. Right now, a 1.0 a 1 centigrade rise in average global temperature is confirmed based on observed evidence. 
Two degrees center light, centigrade is a borderline beyond which catastrophic outcomes are expected. This will include floods, so seriously damaged ecological systems, and so on. The reason for the rush to reach the greenhouse gas emission level at or below the pre-industrial era is threefold. First, already some irreversible damage have happened. Second, there is a tight schedule to reach the climate goals and it demands quick and pragmatic action rather than policies, resolutions, and aspiratory promises. Third, there are pollutants that are called short-lived pollutants, such as methane, that is naturally produced in landfills and cattle farms. These pollutants can be a hundred times more damaged to the earth in terms, in terms of boosting global warming. Greenhouse gas emissions are the harmful gases emitted into our atmosphere from activities such as burning fossil fuels, like gas or diesel in a vehicle. And these gases are causing climate change. In Muskoka, based on the 2018 greenhouse gas inventory, 74% of all greenhouse gas emissions in Muskoka are caused by tailpipe emissions of burning fossil fuels in vehicles. In order to reduce Muskoka's G greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the impacts of climate change, we need, need to use more sustainable forms of transportation. Bear in mind that that 74% was based on the 2018 inventory, which is the latest inventory we have. And we know from empirical evidence that that amount is much higher in 2023. An international team of scientists recently issued a new assessment of planetary health that says the world has entered uncharted climate territory, and life on planet Earth is under siege. The report, published in the journal Bioscience, Science, found that 20 of 35 identified vital signs of the planet, including human population, greenhouse gas emissions, sea level rise in oceans, and acidity, have reached record extremes. The analysis, authored by a dozen expert scientists, is as much a desperate warning as an urgent call for action. For several decades, scientists have consistently warned of a future marked by extreme climactic conditions because of escalating global temperatures caused by ongoing human activities that release harmful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The report states, unfortunately, time is up. We are entering an unfam unfamiliar domain regarding our climate crisis. The situation has no one has ever witnessed firsthand in the history of humanity. This year has truly been one of extremes. Unprecedented heat waves, record shattering land and sea surface temperatures, record low Antarctic sea ice extent, and a Canadian wildfire season that has so far torched over 45 million acres, more than 2.5 times the previous record. This stunning unfiltered assessment comes as many scientists are still trying to make sense of the climate anomalies documented in recent months. Impacts are happening, events are occurring in ways that we never predicted or in accelerated levels of impact that were never predicted. The changes have been so rapid that they surprise scientists and cause concern about the dangers of extreme weather risky climate feedback loops and the approach of damaging tipping points sooner than expected. And this has occurred against the backdrop of what the authors described as minimal progress by humanity in combating climate change. Minimal progress. Human activity, primarily the world's addiction to fossil fuels, is the main driver of planetary warming and the extreme weather conditions causing devastation around the globe. Global heating is accelerating faster than is currently understood and will result in a key temperature threshold being breached as soon as this decade, according to research led by James Hansen. 
who first alerted the world to the greenhouse gas effect. Remember, the threshold we're talking about right now is 1.5 degrees centigrade. The Earth's climate is more sensitive to human-caused changes than scientists have realized, meaning that a dangerous burst of heating will be unleashed that will push the world to be 1.5 degrees centigrade hotter than it was on average in pre-industrial times and possibly two degrees centigrade hotter by 2050. This alarming speed of global heating, which would mean the world breaches the internationally agreed 1.5 centigrade threshold set out in the Paris Climate Agreement far sooner than expected, which risks a world less, less tolerable to humanity with greater climate extremes. There is a huge amount of global heating in the pipeline because of this continued burning of fossil fuels, and Earth being very sensitive to the impacts of this. Far more sensitive than the best estimate laid out by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. It's hard to know what's unlikely anymore in terms of warming. Minimal fossil fuel has declined in recent years, not even coal. Five key takeaways from the dire IPCC climate report, that is the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The planet is almost certain to warm far beyond what, they, what we have hoped, with just a thin path to avert a host of terrifying outcomes for humanity and the animal kingdom. But the report also maintains hope that the worst effects of climate change may be averted. Here are the five key takeaways from the report. Climate change has already wreaked havoc on the planet. The planet has already warmed an average of 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, altering ecosystems worldwide. The warmer world has impacted food and water security, led to the extinction of hundreds of species, caused mass mortality events, and led to the irreversible retreat of glaciers and rise in sea levels. Extreme weather events are increasing in intensity and severity, with some, un some areas of the world facing undue levels of damage and loss. An estimated 3.3 billion to 3.6 billion people live in areas that are highly vulnerable to climate change, with the largest impacts felt by low-income nations in Africa, Asia, Central and South America. Number two, every bit of warming matters. Risks increase with every increment of global warming and will compound and cascade one on top of the other while the planet gets warmer. There are higher for global warming of 1.5 centigrade than at present and even higher at 2 degrees centigrade. With further warming, climate change risk will become increasingly complex and more difficult to manage. Number three. The impacts of climate change are and will continue to be severe. The food production web and fisheries around the globe will see sharp drops in productivity that expand dramatically in higher warming scenarios. The heat and humidity risk to human health in a large band along the equator will increase dramatically, with some regions seeing hundreds of days a year under severe temperatures of high warming scenarios. Many of these impacts, including sea level rise, are now unavoidable, unavoidable, because the IPCC notes, if the world fails to act, the likelihood and impacts of abrupt and irreversible changes in the climate system, including changes triggered when tipping points are reached, increase. The warmer the world, the more animal species at risk. Without adaptation, climate change will dramatically and irreversibly damage the world. At higher levels of warming, entire sectors of the planet will see huge chunks of biodiversity face potentially dangerous temperature conditions. As climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe notes, 
Those risks will be felt keenly by ocean species that are already suffering, like the Great Barrier Reef, and animals that live in already warm tropical zones. Number five, there's a window to act, but it is small and getting smaller. The extent at which future generations will experience a warmer world depends on decisions made now or in the very near future, the IPCC report warns. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade or even 2 degrees centigrade requires rapid, deep, and in most cases, immediate greenhouse gas emission reductions. The world has not yet committed to anything close to that so far. Currently implemented policies will see global warming levels far higher than scientists have predicted. Doing so would require the world to quickly phase out and roll back oil and gas projects, which is not happening, and invest trillions each year in clean energy and climate mitigation measures, three to six times more than the planet's governments and businesses already spend. The 1.5 degree centigrade limit is achievable, the United Nations Secretary General said Monday, but it will take a quantum leap in climate action. We have been informed about saving energy decades ago. It started with turning the lights off. Perhaps many people know that large appliances such as a washing machine consumes more energy than a mini mixer. But how to go greener is still a burden. Green efforts are sometimes miscommunicated and confusing. And there is always this status quo bias. I don't want things to change. I'm quite happy the way things are. The key to reaching the goal of being green in the 2050s is a triangle of synergy. Individuals, society, and government. Individual activities, although necessary, is not enough. Our social task is to fight climate change by sharing this concern and encouraging others to join the campaign. Remember Kathleen Hayhoe's comment on slide number two about talking about this issue and encouraging others to join the campaign. Just like what we saw in the pandemic, which we have just come out of. Behavioral change is quite possible. Even fast change is possible and, in, and can outweigh that bias mentioned earlier. All we need is being clearly informed, what I'm trying to do in this lecture, and synergy. A policy is required to secure the goal of 2030 and 2050. The fact that the lockdown of New York reduced the emissions by 10% during COVID suggests that individual efforts accompanied by policies and all entities working together against climate change and the effect of Climate change not only impacts our health, but also has adverse economic effects. The immediate impact that comes to mind is what damaged infrastructures due to a flooding event costs for government at different levels or an extra load on our health system due to disease. However, there are some other costs. Canada, like several other countries, uses a carbon tax system to reduce harmful emissions. The carbon tax is a mechanism to make pollutants financially responsible. It includes individuals as well as industries. To put it simply, the government of Ontario was planning to gradually increase the carbon tax to $170 per ton of emissions in 2030. Sorry, that should be the government of Canada. Each liter of gas burned in our car emits 2.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide. If the car tank capacity is 50 liters, the carbon tax by 2030 could be as much as $20 for filling up your tank. This gradually increasing trend of gas and tempting incentives paid for by the government for hybrid and electric cars might be encouraging to move to hybrid or electric cars in the future. The other financial impact of climate change is directly tied to the oil industry. Massive investments in the oil industry make it hardly possible to suddenly shift away from gas to electric cars or renewable sources. 
As an example, the government of UAE, which is hosting the Climate Change Conference in Dubai, have recently announced massive increases in gas and oil production. There are debates because the oil industry still finds it profitable to invest despite the carbon tax and other limiting environmental regulations. Therefore, policies at a high level are still required to switch to cleaner energies at a reasonably faster pace. Regardless of the political intervention in the process, our responsibility as members of society and our commitment can greatly contribute to the fight against climate change. The Muskoka Watershed Council 2023 report card, which I will speak to more detail in the next slide, reminds the community of the importance of our environment, points to issues of concern, and reminds us of the steps we should be taking to maintain environmental health. Our beautiful, healthy environment is deteriorating in a number of ways. And if we do not substantially alter the way in which we manage it, it could degrade beyond recognition over the next couple of decades. The deterioration is slow and we have fallen victim to what ecologists call the shifting baseline. When confronted with a slow process of environmental decline, <clears throat> most observers, including environmental managers, may not notice it. Conditions are only marginally different than they were last year. And the same is true next year and maybe the year after. This pattern subconsciously shifts our mental baseline so that we see the world as pretty much like it was last year. In 2023, we see evidence of change, increasing levels of toxic road salt in our lakes, shorter winters and more algae blooms. We have to recognize that our management regimes, whether governmental, private sector or individual, are inadequate and will have to be strengthened. The problem lies partly in the structure of environmental management, the lack of integration across the watershed, the top-down top down regulatory framework and compartmentalization of management responsibilities. We therefore need a substantial culture shift, a different way of looking at how we manage our environment. All this means that simply raising awareness and trying to nudge people into changing their behavior is unlikely to have the necessary impact. Despite high awareness, high eco anxiety and calls for immediate change, the public believes others should take responsibility for action. The public believe action should either be a group effort between all forms of government <clears throat> businesses and individuals, or just national government. It seems that we know the problem. We know how to solve it. We know we're all in it together, and everyone needs to play their part, but we seem incapable of action. This is called climate complacency. And recent studies find, sadly, that even the most informed people would rather take the easy option. Studies have found that regardless of an individual's stated environmental opinion and beliefs, most people opted for the easiest but least impactful option. This goes against the oft expressed view that all we need to do is explain just how bad the situation is and people will change. Earlier this fall, the Muskoka Watershed Council was pleased to release the latest edition of the Muskoka Watershed Report Card, a comprehensive scientific assessment of the health of Muskoka's watersheds. Produced every five years, this report card provides critical insights into the state of our watershed, offering valuable information to both residents and decision makers. The Muskoka Watershed Report Card serves as an essential tool to guide sustainable practices to preserve our remarkable natural environment, supporting both our way of life and our economy. 
The health of the watershed or its ecological integrity is a measure of its ability to maintain its structure and functions under varying stresses. So just how healthy is the Muskoka watershed? Quoting from the report, the Muskoka's watershed stands at a critical turning point. While currently healthy, they are gradually degrading in several ways, and our existing management system seems incapable of halting or reversing this negative trend. We need an integrated watershed scale management system capable of dealing with the multiple stresses our iconic environment now faces. The background report to the report card offers insight into 14 key indicators. I will highlight only a few and I would urge you to read all of the indicators on the MuskokaWatershed.org website. Ice dynamics. Since 1975, the duration of winter ice coverage has fallen by 20 days, impacting winter recreation, tourism, the construction industry, and lake dynamics, the way in which our lakes function ecologically. Severe storms. Since 2000, the watershed has seen twice as many severe storms compared to the 30 years before that time. Spring flooding is caused by a combination of high snowpack, rapid snowmelt, and heavy rain during the thaw. Chloride increase. Lakes are becoming saltier, with 70% now exceeding their natural salt levels, and 24% have chloride levels that threaten aquatic life. Calcium decline. Soil and lake calcium levels have been declining due to acid rain, changing land use, and climate change. This decline affects critically important aquatic organisms like Daphnia and other zooplankton, which rely on calcium for skeleton formation and function. Algae bloom increase. Harmful algae blooms, including toxic blue-green varieties, are becoming more common impacting the beauty and economy of the region while raising health risks. These trends cannot be addressed independently of each other, nor with local actions alone. The Muskoka Watershed Council highlights the importance of adopting comprehensive solutions across the entire watershed. An integrated watershed management approach allows consideration of multidisciplinary solutions, coordinated across municipalities. This approach will benefit communities and the economy, and it can be incorporated into land use policy, climate action, infrastructure planning, and environmental initiatives. I would encourage you to learn more about integrated watershed management on the Muskoka Watershed Council website. Please talk to your family and friends and work colleagues and urge them to talk to their local councillors and ask them to support and to fund this important initiative. Recent research studies submitted to the United Nations Committee on Climate highlights why this is now so critically important. It is estimated that greenhouse gas emissions, rather than declining to net 50 by 2030, may in fact increase every year until 2030. And the production of new fossil fuels may increase by 100% during that same period. I will end the presentation with a few brief concluding remarks. I believe that I have given you sufficient information for you to assess for yourself about whether the impacts of changes in our climate are real and whether you are prepared to become involved in enacting solutions. For more information on this, please go to the MuskokaWatershed.org website. There are many background reports to the report card and many documents of scientific data and reports are also available on that website. There is much to learn about climate change on that, on that website. website. 
knowledge, knowledge is, is key. key. Lecture number two will be much more optimistic and will demonstrate that there is still time that together we can slow down climate change and adapt our environment and our lives to the inevitable changes that are already underway. I started the presentation by talking about hope and I will conclude with that message. Remember the client scientist Catherine Hayhoe who said the best weapon to fight climate change is hope. In the past, there have been a number of environmental emergencies that collectively we addressed, and we were successful in doing what needed to be done. We can do it again. Thank you for your interest in this matter and for attending this presentation. I hope to see you again very soon for lecture number two.